Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us here tonight uh, for a webinar all about choosing a course and university. Uh, my name is James Casey. I'm a schools and colleges liaison officer here at Royal Holloway. Um, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, the sort of structure of tonight's session, uh, we are joined here this evening by Jim, Jim Cowcut, who is our schools and colleges liaison manager. Um, he's going to be speaking for probably around half an hour, uh, up, to, up to half an hour. Uh, and then we're going to go on to a small Q&A section as well. So if you do have any questions um, at any point during the session, please do submit them uh, in our chat function. Or of course, I know that some of you have pre-submitted questions. Uh, so yes, hopefully we will have time to go through some of them together as well. Um, I will also just note quickly that this evening's uh, session will be recorded. So if you do want to catch up on it at any point uh, in the coming weeks, the coming months even, uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, in the following days. Um, so yes, I will introduce Jim to you now. Uh, and Jim, at the same time, I'll also pass over to you as well. So thank you very much and enjoy this evening's webinar. Thank you very much, James. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as James has said, my name is Jim Kalka. I am the Schools and Colleges Liaison Manager at Royal Holloway University. Um, and as has been said, this evening's session is about choosing a course and choosing a university. So um, before I get started, a little bit about Royal Holloway. So hopefully you know a little bit about Royal Holloway, hence why you're here this evening and you've seen that this webinar is taking place. But we're a top 30 university in just outside of southwest London. We're part of the University of London as well. So we have really good connections with lots of universities within London. As you can see from the stats on the screen, um, so really good for, for student satisfaction as well as graduate employment. Uh, this, this is our campus in Egham, as I said, just outside of southwest London, um, Egham and Surrey, set on 135 acres of woodland, as you can see here, including our, our really famous founders building on the left hand side there, um, which is our Victorian castle, essentially. Um, and a list of our courses, so kind of what we currently offer at Royal Holloway as departments, so as you can see, everything from the arts, humanities, social sciences, sciences, everywhere and, and in between there as well, so lots of different options available at Royal Holloway. Um, but this evening, I will be talking about the following things. So first and foremost, we're going to start off by talking about what university actually is. And this may sound like a really simple question and a really sort of silly question to ask, uh, but it's really important that we have a really clear definition of what we mean by university and its purpose. Then I'm going to talk about why people go to university. So what are the factors that, pe that people consider when considering about their, their options after sixth form or after, after college or whatever. Uh, then going to talk about how you choose a university and then how you choose a course. And we're going to talk at the end about putting all of that together, essentially. So what the next step, hopefully, from this session is, what your actions are going to be from this session today. So to start off with, let's think about what university actually is. So if you factor about university, there's around 143 universities available in the UK and around 50,000 undergraduate courses to choose from. Now, 143 universities, this number fluctuates every year, so this includes, uh, often includes uh, public universities in the UK. Uh, same with the 50,000 courses, obviously new courses being added in every year, courses being taken out, et cetera, et cetera. But we kind of, sort of put, our, put our finger on it and say around 143 universities with 50,000 courses. Now, that's not necessarily 50,000 different subjects. They, those courses could have the same name, so like English and English, um, but they're slightly different on, on where they're provided, or the university that they're taught at, but also what makes up that course as well. So even though you may have a clear idea of the subject you want to study, let's say, for example, criminology, okay, I really want to study criminology, great, you can get rid of 49,000 courses out of that 50,000, excellent, you've got rid of the bulk of them, but you're still left with 1,000 courses. So that's why sessions like this are so important, at hopefully, you know, stage in your, in your school in life, maybe year 12 or, or first year of college, or maybe even a little bit later on in kind of year 13, and thinking about going to university next year. Well, these sessions are important to really consider these, these areas because it can take a while to, to work out exactly where you want to study and what you want to study. Learning at university is very different to school and college and I'm sure you're fully aware of that. Um, so at university you have to be far more independent over your own work, over your own actions, your attendance, your time management, all of these things. But also you have loads more responsibility as well. So responsibility on, on making sure that your work is to the standard and quality that you would expect it to be, um, but also that it's in on time and it's, and it's kind of there and ready to, to go essentially. You can live at home or move away for university as well, of course. So um, lots of students decide to move away and move away far away and you know, start their lives afresh. Because also, as well as attending the university, you're also living and moving into a new area. But also lots of students live at home. So around a third of our students at Royal Holloway currently are what we, what we um, term as commuter students. So they live at home and then they travel into university every day. 
very similar probably to how you are doing at the moment with going to sixth form or college. So there's no right or wrong answer here, it's completely up to you and there will be university options available to you for, for either of these. Uh, an undergraduate degree often lasts around three years, so the undergraduate degree is the degree that you'll be looking to do as your first degree, so your first kind of time at university, so as you've left college or sixth form. And as I said, three years is usually the time that it, it, it goes over. We'll talk a little bit later on how that can be maybe four years long as an undergraduate degree or, or you know, even, you know, even more than that as well. There is a cost uh, associated to university in the UK. So the cost of studying in the UK for a UK student is around £9,200 a year. And that is just for your tuition cost. So it's your cost of studying at university. There also uh, are living costs um, on top of that, so your maintenance costs. Um, but I'll discuss a little bit more about that in a moment. And when you apply through UCAS, so the um, University Colleges Admission Service, where you'll do your application, you select five courses. So as I said earlier, you have 50,000 uh, undergraduate courses to choose from. You have to whittle that down to five, essentially. So get that 50,000 down to five and get that 143 universities down to probably five, maybe four. So how do you get there? So first and foremost, often lots of universities will have a very uh, sort of minimum requirement in the GCSEs. At Royal Holloway, for example, we ask for five GCSEs at grade four to nine, including English and Maths. A levels, BTEC, T levels as well are going to be important. So that, that kind of level, uh, sort of level three qualification also is going to be important. Um, and that might be to certain grades. So depending on what your offer is from that university, and offers may vary from three C to three A stars, depending on the course and the university, or three distinction stars to, uh, to three passes. Um, it will depend on the course and the, and the institution. So it's really important to be aware of that. There may also be specific subject requirements as well that you have to bear in mind. So for some courses that are perhaps more maths orientated, you may leave, either need to have a certain grade at maths GCSE, so maybe a six or a seven, but also you might need to have an A level in maths or something like that. So again, it's really important that when you are doing your research on the course that you're looking to study, you are looking into detail at those specific subject requirements as well. There are certain, certain flexible options as well, and I guess the pandemic has really um, made universities far more flexible with what they offer to students. So you have things like contextual offers. So contextual offers are given to students from a certain background. So that could be a certain a socioeconomic background, that could be a certain um, ethnic background, that could be a multitude of different reasons. And sometimes that contextual offer will result in you receiving a grade lower than what the university standard offer. At Royal Holloway, we usually offer two grades below what our standard offer is. So if our standard, standard offer is three A's, if you qualify for a contextual offer, your offer will be ADV. Um, if you are interested in a contextual offer and you think that you might um, sort of tick that box to receive a contextual offer, do you take a look on our website and look at the widening access pages on our website and you'll be able to find out a bit more about the contextual offer and what that means. There's also the option of deferring your university place. That means essentially uh, having a place at university but pushing it ahead to the, year, the, the next year. So instead of going to university, say, in 2024, and you're going to apply for the university this year, to, you know, for 2024 entry, you decide to defer for 2025 entry instead. So you just push it back a year. Most universities are accepting of this. You can sometimes also, when you apply through UCAS, apply for that later year, so you can do that automatically. Um, but my advice with that is if you are considering deferring and you have an offer already, or if you're considering deferring from the start, contact those universities you're interested in, and they'll be able to tell you exactly what they're after and what they can offer for you. Foundation years, we'll talk about these in a bit more detail later, but a foundation year is also referred to as a year zero. This kind of is a bridge between what you're currently studying, A levels, B tech, T levels, and your first year at university. Again, I'll go into a bit more detail about that later on. And finally, there's the option of part time or online study. So perhaps splitting your degree rather than over three years, over six years, so you can maybe work full time or do other things alongside it, but also online study. So distance learning, this is often referred to, and lots of universities now offer distance learning courses, I guess as a result of the pandemic and making things far more accessible. Well, I guess the big organisation that's been doing this for a really long time is the Open University. All of their courses are online and distance learning. So again, if that's something that you think would be would work for you, it's definitely worth considering. And I mentioned the cost earlier. So the cost of university, as I mentioned earlier, is £9,250 a year for three years um, for UK students. For international students, that might vary depending on the course and the university. So I do really um, encourage you to take a look at that in more detail if you are an international student. There is also the living cost on top of that as well, so your actual cost of living, your, your rent, your food, your bills, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. UK students can get a student loan from the government uh, that you don't have to pay back until after you've graduated, and you can get two loans. So one loan covers the full cost of your tuition, so about £9,250 a year, but also a loan that covers the cost of living, so your living costs as well. 
you only pay these back when you're earning more than £25,000 a year. So you have to be earning above the £25,000 a year threshold to pay back any money on these loans that you've taken out. And 40 years after your first payment of, um, of, 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 of these loans will be wiped. So the remaining balance of these um, loans will be wiped after 40 years of your first payment. There's also other things to be considering, part-time jobs, scholarships, bursaries, so lots of other options available to you to fund your studies. So moving away kind of from the financial stuff and looking more at the logistical stuff of actually applying to university, this is a visual representation of the UCAS process. So this is what the process of applying to university looks like. So if you are in year 12 or your first year of college, from, from this month, you can actually register on UCAS and start um, building your profile essentially. And your profile will be lots of information about yourself, your name, date of birth, email address. It'll also be to do with your fee status, so whether or not you're a UK or an international student. It could be asking questions about whether or not you have a disability. That's really so that um, the university can perhaps enroll you in, an, in, a, in a bursary, so an automatic award um, that's relevant to a certain disability or circumstance you're in. But it could also be so that they can prepare for you and started with, with arrangements for you essentially. So it's definitely really important to put down as much information as possible on that. You also have your personal statement, which is a reflective essay for you to write. Um, you have your choices, which you kind of obviously we're going to be chatting about today. So your course and your, um, your university choices, your reference, which will be written by your teachers or your tutors. So that's basically backing up what you've said in your personal statement. You then sign and declare that all this works your own. You make a short admin, a small admin payment of £27. So that money goes to UCAS as an organisation, not to the university, not to, into my pocket or anyone else's to UCAS as an organisation essentially to fund the processing of these applications because they're, they're processing hundreds of thousands of applications every year. Your application is then submitted. Uh, the universities will then receive that application, so your individual application, but each university won't be able to see where else you've applied. So at Royal Holloway, you apply to us, I'll be able to see that you've applied to Royal Holloway for this particular course, but I won't be able to see where else you've applied. Once you've received all of your responses from universities, so these could be offers, so this could be a conditional offer, so that means you have a place at that university on the condition that you meet X, Y, and Z. So that could be grades, it could be an interview, whatever. Or you can get an unconditional offer. That means that you have a place at this university. If you accept it, full stop. That place is assured for September. The third um, response that you can get is an unsuccessful response. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about what that means. But unfortunately, that means that you've not been made an offer at that university. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't go to that university at all. You can apply again in the next year. You may even be able to uh, pick up a place through clearing at that university. But at that point, it means that you don't have an offer from that university. Once you've received all of those responses, so all five of those responses, um, you then choose what's called a firm and an insurance. Your firm is your first choice, and that's the university that everything considered that, you know, if you get all the grades and all the right things, will be the university that you'll be attending. And then you also get an insurance um, place as well. So you get to choose your insurance, and that is basically your backup. That is your safety net, essentially. This is all then confirmed on results day, and where you're going and what results you've got, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully you've got the right results that you need, and you'll be starting at university in that September. So we've talked about what university is, and we've kind of set that bit of a context. Why do people go to university then? So there's three kind of main factors, three kind of air categories, I guess, is probably a better way of terming it. First is academics. So it's an opportunity to gain a significant subject knowledge. So you may be looking to study a subject that you absolutely love and you want to find out more about. Going to university is going to really give you that opportunity to really dedicate three years of your life to that, that learning about that subject. You may be taught by subject experts. So these could be people that you've, um, you know, you, that you've heard of, that you've read their books, and you've idolised for years, and now they're your teachers. You're in a room with, with them and five other people listening to them and learning from them. It's a fantastic once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I did a history degree, and on, my, on the degree that I did was one of the academics uh, wrote the textbooks that I'd been studying for, studying for the last four years. Really, really cool to have that insight and really get to know that person academically and really learn from them. You may be able to access state-of-the-art facilities, so the opportunity to get hands-on with, you know, maybe a massive telescope or an MRI scanner or, you know, certain bits of, bits of equipment. You know, these, these things don't come cheap and access isn't always available. So university may allow you access to, to get hands on with, with your subject. And finally, it's to develop transferable skills, which is really, really important. So lots of graduate employers don't ask what your degree is in. They don't ask for what course it's in, but they ask your skills and what grades you got, essentially. So every university degree, um, whether it's an art, a humanities, a science or a social science, will have a whole host of transferable skills that you'll pick up throughout your study. There's also the personal reasons as well for going to university. So the opportunity to gain independence, of course, really important. So that's academic and personal independence. 
it's an opportunity to pay, maybe to see new places. So perhaps you decided to move away from home and you're going to move to a new city or a new area or even a new country. You may decide to go to Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland or England for the first time or even further afield. But also within your course, you may have the opportunity of doing field trips. So going and studying in an area for, for about a couple of weeks or a week. You may have the opportunity to do a year abroad where you go and study in a different country for a year. Or you may go on society or sports club trips to a different country. So an opportunity to see brand new places. There's also that opportunity to meet new people, make friends, but also meet people professionally and build up your personal and your professional network. And finally, there's the opportunity to take part in new experiences, whether that's picking up a new sport for the first time, whether that's getting involved in an activism group or getting involved in a religious group or whatever that is. Um, university offers you a whole host of experiences and opportunities for you to get involved in. And finally, it's the professionals, the professional reasons. The first is actually getting work experience. So you may have the opportunity of doing what's called a sandwich year or a year in industry or a year in business, which means that you have a year out from your degree, you go and get hands on experience and you come back and finish your degree with that experience behind you, essentially. These can be great opportunities for graduate employment, but also those transferable skills we've talked about as well. And lots of universities will offer them. It might be the start of a certain career path. This could be the first step on that kind of long road to the, the dream job that you're after, or a dream career that you're after. If you want to be a doctor, for example, you know, getting a university degree in medicine or another subject and converting into graduate medicine will be that first stepping stone on that pathway. University may make you more employable, so it may give you those skills and those opportunities that look really impressive on a CV or a job application. So really important to consider that. And finally, there's an opportunity to perhaps earn more money in the long run as well. The piece of research done by the Department of Education a couple of years ago found that on average, graduates people that went to university, finished university, earned around £9,000 more on average over the course of their career than non-graduates, so people that didn't go to university. So that's a huge kind of gap. Obviously, that's an average. That doesn't mean that everyone that goes to university is going to earn £9,000 a year more than people that don't go to university. But what I always usually say with, with university is that it opens more doors than it closes. It gives you a lot more opportunities than it takes away. You may be rejected from a job because you don't have a university degree, but it's very rare that you'll be rejected from a job for having a university degree, if that makes sense. So let's consider you know, this, this second big question. So the first big question, I guess, what we've kind of covered already is uh, why university? Why should I go and study university? What are the reasons for studying university? Um, let's consider and, and, and assume that everyone uh, on the call today has gone, yep, after what you said, I definitely want to go to university now. Now, how do we choose where to go to university? So I said around 143, 145 different options. How do you choose? The first way of choosing is, is thinking about what types of universities there are. And we have three main types of universities in the UK. The first is the city university. So this means it's based in a city, so perhaps London or Leeds or Manchester or Glasgow. And essentially the university is across the city. So you don't have just one location that you go to. There's multiple locations that you travel to across that city. So for example, if you're living in London, you may get up in the morning, get on the tube to your lecture, you then, then might walk from your lecture theatre to the library, then the library to the gym, and then you know, get the tube back home again, and then go back again for a sports club. So it's like commuting, essentially. You're commuting around the city to go to university, essentially. You also have the campus type of university. So a campus type of university is similar to what Royal Holloway is like. And as I showed you at the beginning, that map of Royal Holloway basically shows that everything's on the one site, or pretty much over the one site. And that's what a campus university is. It's over the one site, so everything's close together. So you might live on campus, study on campus, There'll be a shop, a doctor's surgery, a sports facility, everything kind of there that you need. It's like its own little mini town, essentially. And finally, you have the collegiate style of university. So collegiate style, in a way, combines both the city and the campus. The collegiate style university is um, you have one big overarching university, but then you have much smaller campuses and what, what's called much smaller colleges that make up that university. So, for example, at Oxford and Cambridge, they're collegiate style universities. So you'll be a part of the University of Oxford or the University of Cambridge. But also you'll be a part of a smaller college, which might be where you live and study. It might just be where you live um, for, for, for your three years. It might be where you live and do everything. That is your own kind of mini campus. So collegiate style university is a little bit rarer, but kind of combines the two a little bit. And there's loads of other factors to be considering. So I'm going to talk through, um, talk through them now with you. So the first is accommodation. So where can you live? Uh, is there accommodation on campus? Is there accommodation that the university runs? Is there accommodation close to the university? If there is, how much does it cost? what's included, uh, will you have your own bathroom, will you have to cook for yourself? There's lots of different factors when considering accommodation. I guess another one is as well is, is the university close enough to my house? That means that I don't need to move out and I can stay at home. 
there's lots of different options available and it's about considering those options when you're looking at universities. Another is study spaces, so both individual and group study spaces. So with individual study spaces, if you are a student that loves to work at night, so from like nine o'clock at night until one o'clock in the morning, that's when you do your best work, you don't want a library that is only open nine till five. Um, because that's not going to be any use to you. You want a library that's 24 7 or 24 5. Okay. So it's definitely worth considering that and considering where your individual study spaces are going to be and whether or not that fits into your lifestyle and how you prefer to study. Also, with group study spaces, considering space for that. So lots of university courses will have group elements to them. Um, so you're thinking about where you can study in a group where you're not going to be shift if you're in the library, um, but has enough space to be conducive of, of discussion and ideas and for you to get your work done. Another one is sports facilities. So, uh, you know, if you're a budding uh, swimmer or cyclist, for example, you want to make sure that you have the right facilities there or nearby the university so you can continue that. You know, if you're considering just, you know, taking up a sport as a hobby or just to keep fit or something like that, then, you know, looking at whether or not there's social leagues or sports clubs or, or a gym or things like that as well. Again, this builds up that, you know, it's a small piece of the puzzle that builds up that much broader picture. Another thing is looking at social areas. So um, contrary to popular belief, university isn't all just about studying. There's a lot of social elements to it as well. So thinking about, you know, where the local restaurants are or the local coffee shops or nightclubs or bars or pubs or whatever it is um, that you enjoy doing. So making sure that there's enough social areas there for you as well. Think about food and drink. So students often laugh at me when I say about food and drink in kind of supermarkets uh, and how important they are when choosing a university. Consider this, if you have a quite a tight budget, but the only two close supermarkets nearby are M&S and Waitrose, you might not be able to afford your weekly shop all the time or, or not afford the food that you want. So it's worth bearing that in mind. You want to make sure you have like an Aldi or a Lidl. I should say I don't work for any of these organisations. I'm not promoting any of them, but it's worth considering these different options there. Again, it's about considering the price of things. So you may not be involved in your weekly shop at home currently. Um, and you might be shocked like I was about how expensive cheese is, how expensive a certain type of cheese is, about five pounds, it's crazy. So again, it's these things that seem quite trivial, quite small, that are really important. And again, are a small piece of a, a much larger puzzle, essentially. You also want to consider where the local coffee shops are, restaurants, bars, cafes, nightclubs, all that type of stuff in the local area, as well as on campus or at the university. And finally, it's about support services, considering the support services at the university. And in my opinion, this is the most important factor. So thinking about, you know, the uh, well-being support, the financial support, the career support, the social support that the university offers you. Um, as a university, is going to be a brand new experience for, for pretty much everyone that's going there. Um, but, you know, 99% of the people that are going to university will be going for the first time. So, again, support is really important. It's a brand new experience. A couple of things about visiting universities as well. And I'm a real advocate for making sure that you can visit a university in person. And there's three main ways that you can do that. So the first is an open day, and that's a kind of an all singing, all dancing affair where everyone's out. There's academics everywhere. There's professional services staff, there's student ambassadors. Uh, they may have free coffee. They might have a, a radio station in the, in, uh, in a certain area. There might be, you know, food out. There might be, you know, opportunities to take a picture of the mascot. You know, it's a really big kind of festival environment, uh, which is great because it gives you an opportunity to see loads of the university, talk to loads of people and kind of get a real feel for kind of what it's like on those days. Uh, and maybe even you know look around the university as well of course um but what open day doesn't do gives you it doesn't give you kind of a day-to-day -day feeling of that similarly a taster day will be very similar to an open day but a much smaller scale so to a more of an academic or department focused sort of way of this so it might be all singing or dancing in your department you might get a tour of the department and the facilities you may have a taste lecture in a lab or a seminar you might be able to speak to current students things like that but again it kind of gives you that all singing or dancing approach the last one is a campus tour. So just looking around the university, whether that's with a student ambassador for a current student or a self-guided tour where you basically take yourself around the university. So this is what I say is an opportunity for you to see the university on a normal day. Um, so I really recommend that you go to an open day or a taste day or both, but you also go to a campus tour if you can, or just go to the university on a day where there, there isn't anything on. Because you have to remember that every day that you're at that university is not going to be like an open day. There are going to be quieter days and you want to make sure that you feel comfortable in that environment on those days. But if you do decide to go to an open day or a taste day, a few tips for you. The first is to prepare. So make sure that you know exactly where you're going, what time you need to be there, why you're going as well, what's the purpose. Make sure that you know that they do your course and all of these things are really important. Um, I advise bringing family or friends um, along with you. Not only are they uh, a second pair of eyes, but also a travel companion. 
Um, but also they can go along to things when you're in other things. So you might be in, a, in an academic session, they may be able to go to a student finance session. So it basically doubles up, you can see more of the university. So it's really good opportunity to, to have, um, get more out of, your, out of your experience. But also, as I said, it's a great way of you know, not doing these things on your own. Um, and finally, is ask questions. So these events are vital for asking questions. Really, really important um, to ask as many questions as possible. Really important to ask as many questions as possible. It's vital to remember that the purpose of these days isn't for people to come in to work on a Saturday or for you know getting free coffee or having a picture of the mascot. The purpose of these days is for you to find out more about that university and whether or not that is somewhere that you'd like to study further. So it's really important you do ask as many questions as you can. So we've talked about choosing a university, let's go on to choosing a course, so actually the subject that you're going to study. Um, and we've kind of touched on some of these already, but there's different types of degrees available in the UK. The first is the foundation year. This, is, this will take place prior to that undergraduate course, that first degree, like I've mentioned already, and I'll talk a bit in a bit more detail about it in a second. And it's often integrated with an undergraduate degree. So instead of doing a three-year degree, you'll do a four-year degree, one-year foundation year at the beginning, and then just a three-year normal kind of undergraduate degree, essentially. And the purpose for this is kind of twofold, I guess. The first is to provide additional support for you. So that could be additional support on your studies, for, on your subject area, on your study skills. It may also be if you've kind of perhaps missed your grades um, and you still want, you know, the university still wants you, they may recommend that you do a foundation year and then go on to do the main degree. So you kind of can kind of polish up those skills. But also a foundation year can be useful um, for you if you've decided to change direction. So say, for example, that you've done just humanities at A level, but you go, actually, I'm really interested in, in physics. Maybe a foundation degree might be a good option for you to do that. You do one year kind of on, on maths and physics and sciences, and then you can go on to about the physics degree from that. So again, worth considering if that's kind of uh, in your mind already. The next is the more common type of degree, and I've mentioned this a lot already, is the undergraduate degree or first degree. So as we've mentioned, this is typically three years long in the UK, except Scotland, which is slightly longer. And you have these kind of main categorizations. You have the BA, the Bachelor of Arts, and the BSc, the Bachelor of Science. So BA is more uh, arts-based, so more independent, more research-based, uh, more kind of uh, humanities orientated. A Bachelor of Science is obviously more scientific-based, more practical, more hands-on, more uh, theoretical and uh, experimental. So there's different options there for you. Another one to point out on this list is the LLB. So an LLB is an accrediting law degree. So an LLB in law will mean that you can go on, finish that degree, and then go on to do you know, further study to become a solicitor or a barrister, essentially. So an LLB is usually a really good option for students that are considering going into a career in law. And finally, you have a postgraduate degree. So this is only completed after you've completed that undergraduate degree, and it's typically only a year long. Uh, the categorizations follow a very similar pattern, so the MSc and the MA, very similar to a BA and a BSc. Um, there is another one here, the MRes, which is a master's by a research, um, a master's by research, which is very different. So there's no teaching involved. It's purely just research, and you put together one big project essentially on your own, in your own, uh, you know, independently, um, with a with a with a supervisor helping along the way. Essentially. So lots of different options at you know foundation, undergraduate, and postgraduate level. You can also do more than one subject. So I think we had a pre-submitted question about this, about joint honours programme. So hopefully this will answer it. But if it doesn't, please do pop your question in the chat afterwards and I can go into a bit more detail about it. Um, but joint honours programme essentially means that you can study more than one subject. So if a, joint, if, a, if a course says one subject and another subject, let's say uh, physics and math, that means that your time will be split 50-50 between physics and 50-50 between math. So 50% physics, 50% math. So you're, you're halfway through. So that's quite a common, you know, that's quite a common one. That's quite a... a a normal subject pairing, but let's say something like um, maths and music, okay? So slightly different, so less kind of um, correlation between the two subjects. You'd still be split 50% maths, 50% music. So you pick up half of the maths modules and half of the music modules, and you'll come out at the end with a uh, maths and music degree. So you won't come out with two degrees or two half degrees, you'll come out with one degree in maths and music. The other option is the with option. So that is 75 25 split. So let's say maths with music would be 75% maths, 25% music. So you would pick up three quarters or 75% of the maths modules and a quarter or 25% of the music modules. So again, you don't come out with three quarters of a maths degree and one quarter of a music degree. You come out with a maths with music degree. Okay, hopefully that's clear. But as I said, if it's not, please do pop the questions in the chat and I'm happy to go through them at the end. And again, a few factors to consider when you're thinking about courses, you know, the courses that you're thinking about choosing. So the first is think about what subjects you love. 
but also bearing in mind what subjects you're good at. And I, I usually said there's a balance there. You, you want to do a subject you really enjoy, but you don't want to do a subject that you absolutely adore, but you're not very good at. But equally, you don't want to do a subject that you're excellent at, straight A's, but you can't stand that subject. It's really important to find a middle ground between the two, essentially, because obviously you're going to be, need to be motivated for three years, which is you know, the fourth, fourth point here. Um, so you want to make sure that you enjoy it, but you also are good at it. So you are, you are um, improving and you are growing through the course. You want to think about what topics within that subject you want to explore. So we talked about the 50,000 different courses at the beginning. As I said, all of those courses will be slightly different. They may be taught at different places, but the actual components that make up those courses might be different. So it's really important to be thinking about exactly what it is within that subject, within that course, that you want to study more, what you want to find out more about. So for example, if you're looking to do history, that might be the Tudors. Or if you're looking to do English, that could be Dickens. Or if you think about uh, doing physics, that could be about astrophysics in particular. So again, it's about delving deeper into those topic, into those subject areas. I've mentioned this one kind of very briefly, but you need to think about whether you'll be still be motivated in three years' time. Again, really important. This is, an, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So you want to make sure that you're going to really enjoy that overall, overall experience, not just year one, and then kind of, you know, sort of run out of breath, essentially. And finally, you want to consider what your career goals are. Now, university shouldn't necessarily just be a direction into a career. It might be for some of you, and that's completely fine. Um, but in my opinion, it should be more than that. It's giving you lots of great skills. It's giving you the opportunity to learn about subjects you're really interested in. Um, and it is going to help you ultimately with, you know, getting a career in the future. But if you do have specific career goals, it's about considering how that course can help you get from A to B. If you don't and you're kind of a bit more rounded and you're not quite sure exactly what you want to do at the moment, it's about considering how that degree can help you build up those transferable skills and the things that can help you move forward. So how do we put all of this information together? How, what are kind of our next steps from here? So the first is about thinking about your plans and your priorities. So after this session, I really recommend that you take five or 10 minutes just to reflect on what your plans and priorities are. You might want to jot these down in a notebook or on your phone or whatever, or on your laptop, whatever it is. But think about what, you know, what your plans are. Do you have career goals? Do you have a career plan at the moment? It's okay to not have a career plan or a career goal at the moment. But think about what you would enjoy doing in the future. You know, that might be working with people, that might be working in, in an office, that might be working on computers. What is it that you think that you'd enjoy doing? And that's okay for that to change over time, but think about exactly what you want to be, you know, now, how you feel about that now. But also think about your priorities in a university and in a course. You know, think about what I define as your red lines, so the things that cannot be crossed. So things like, you know, I, I have to go to a university that's a campus university, or I have to do a subject that involves field work or something like that. Having these plans and having these priorities in place will really help you when you are going to do that research. Which kind of leads on to the next point, which is actually researching your options. And I'm going to talk about a few places that you can, kind of, that you can access this information later. But researching your options is going to take a fair amount of time. This could take a number of weeks. It could even take a number of months. Because you want to make sure that you're looking at every different option that's available to you. And this might not just be for university. This could be looking at apprenticeships or degree apprenticeships or employer, or employer schemes or things like that, as well as university. And I do recommend that you look at a wide breadth of different opportunities available to you. And finally, you want to start making a shortlist. So this shortlist could start off being 20 universities long. This shortlist could start off being two universities long. Either is fine, but you want to be trying to get to that magic five, that, you know, that five choices that you're going to have. There's five universities, five courses. You want to make sure you're getting to that point, essentially. But what you're going to be doing, kind of I've said over the next couple of weeks, is going between researching and making that shortlist, going back and forth between the two. So a few places that you can find out further information about this and kind of do that research. So first is university perspectives. So these are kind of like pamphlets or, you know, physical books that you may have already collected already, um, which will give you lots of information about the university courses, about the facilities, about a whole host of different things. You can also obviously use on uh, their websites and online perspectives as well to really kind of enrich this further. Another is student reviews, so looking at things like the student room or even social media uh, to find out more about what it's like to study at that university. With this, I do recommend that you take it all with a pinch of salt. I'm sure you're all very tech savvy and social media savvy already, uh, but it is worth bearing in mind that obviously not everything that you read on Twitter or TikTok or whatever is gonna be completely factually correct. So it's about taking it with a pinch of salt. Consider it, consider it but don't necessarily kind of hang, hang your coat on it. The next open days and taste talks like we've mentioned already, so really good opportunities to get a look around the university, but also to experience that course as well. And finally, it's online resources. So looking at online resources that can help you further. So at Royal Holloway, we have a fleet of fantastic online resources uh, from everything from, you know, deciding whether or not to go to university and whether it's right for you, right through to student finance, transitioning to university, personal statements, whole host of resources, videos, worksheets, everything. 
And again, I really encourage you to look at those on our website. Just um, go to the schools and colleges pages on the Royal Holloway website to find those. Another place is UCAS. So UCAS is obviously uh, the main kind of hub of all of this information. So this is kind of perhaps where your start should begin essentially by just doing a keyword search like I've done here with history into kind of the search box and it'll bring up every course that is relevant to that, um, that, that, that you know, what you searched essentially. Um, another platform that kind of does similar to this is Unifrog. So you may have access to Unifrog through your school. And again, Unifrog is a great platform if you do have access to that for things like this and doing that research. Another place is you can taste today. So this is a fantastic website that basically pulls together all resources for students, but also opportunities to visit universities, whether that's taste days, open days, um, open afternoons, campus tours, things like that. So again, a really good opportunity for you to actually, you know, get an idea of what's out, what's out there and what's available to you. And to kind of bring all this together is thinking about a method of actually working out exactly how to decide whether or not a university and a course is right for you. And to do that, we talk about the college method. And this is going to tie together lots of different things we've discussed already today. But I'll go through these individually. So first is course. So again, we've talked about that at length today. So that's thinking about what you want to study, why you want to study it, um, what you're interested in it is specifically. It's thinking about whether or not you're going to be motivating for your time. It's thinking about whether or not it's practical or more theoretical, whether it's going to be more research-based or it's going to be more experimentally based. So again, considering the course and working out whether that is the right course for you. The next is opportunity. So this is opportunity academically. So that could be to go and study in a different country, for example, or do a year in industry. But that could also be opportunity outside of your studies as well. So that could be an opportunity to play in the football team, or it could be to have your own radio show at the university. So again, it's about thinking about those opportunities and what you want out of your university experience. The L is for location. So again, we've talked a lot about that, but thinking about where in the country you want to be. Do you want to be in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, North, South, East, West, close to home, far away from home? Again, lots of factors to consider. The second L is for league table. So considering league table position. Again, this isn't something that you should necessarily take um, kind of on face value. I do really encourage you to, to delve a bit deeper into this as there's lots of different league tables that measure lots of different things essentially. Um, so if you are considering league tables as a factor in deciding where to go to university, I really encourage you to do your own research as well as that, but also research where those league table positions, how they've come about, how the university got first and how another university got tenth. What's the reasoning, reasoning for that? The E here, the first E is for entry requirements. So again, considering what we talked about at the beginning, you know, perhaps GCSE requirements, A-level, BTEC, T-level requirements, specific subject requirements, but also it's about considering what, what's aspirational, what's realistic. I often uh, recommend the, the kind of the two grade boundary rule. So think about two grades above and two grades below what you're predicted. So if you're predicted um, uh, AAB, it's looking at courses that are asking for AAA and A star AA. But also looking at courses that are ABB and BBB. So you've got kind of five different areas there, grade requirements, and you can really stretch your search out over those uh, and considering those. Okay. I'm going to come to the second E first, and I'll go back to the G. So education style, so that's how you're taught. So that's, you know, whether that's hands on, whether that's more lab based, whether that's lecture orientated. So with big classroom, and you can you know, just have to sit and listen, whether that's more discussion led, like a seminar. So again, worth considering. Uh, and then G is for gut. So that's the gut feeling. That is the feeling that you get when you visit somewhere or you look at something. Looking at university, doing your research, looking at the courses should make you excited. It should make you really, really excited to go and study there. Um, I personally went to Royal Holloway and I remember the first time I went to Royal Holloway. I remember getting out of the car, within 20 seconds, I knew straight away that's where I wanted to go. I hadn't spoken to anyone, I hadn't really seen anything. It was a very gloomy and wet day, but I just had that gut feeling being there, feeling that vibe and being in that environment that that was the right place for me. And I really encourage you, as I said, to visit universities to really search for that gut feeling for yourself. So that is all from me today. I hope that's been useful and insightful for you. Um, I'll now hand over to you um, watching. Um, and if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful. And best of luck on your search for a university and a course. Thank you very much, Jim. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really fascinating to hear and hopefully really insightful uh, for the people uh, people joining us this evening as well so yeah thank you so much for your time there um, we have had a few questions come in um, some as I said have been pre-submitted and we've also had one or two come through uh, in the question function as well um, hopefully I can sort of cover all bases I've, I've tried to categorize them a bit so hopefully um, we can sort of cover all bases with your questions um, the first one if I can ask you Jim um, Again, sort of giving a bit more depth maybe to what you sort of spoke about earlier. 
Um, are there certain courses that are less likely to have uh, subject specific requirements? Yeah, really good question. Yeah, really good question. I think it's really important as the first thing is, is to do that research and to look into more detail rather than kind of just the face value of you need to have X A levels when you're looking at every course. Um, I would say from my experience, often the sciences will have um, will have subject specific uh, requirements. So things like math, physics, uh, biology, uh, earth sciences, uh, maybe psychology may have specific requirements. That's purely just so that you have a real good level of knowledge within that particular subject. So within, for example, if you're looking to do a physics degree, the majority of that physics degree is going to be very maths orientated. So having an A and A level math, for example, is going to be really important to you succeeding and thriving on that course. So often, as I said, it, it is often the sciences. Sometimes you will find it in the humanities and the arts as well. Um, but you may also be asked um, to produce other things. So if you're looking to say do graphic design or fine art, you might not be asked for a specific subject requirement, but you may be asked to submit a portfolio. Or if you're looking to do drama, you may not be asked for a particular um, A level in drama, but you may be asked to come and attend an audition. Um, so again, it's worth considering that. And I said, when you are doing that research, looking at those kind of little caveats, if they are there, essentially, and, and finding out more about them, so you don't want to come unstuck with that and, and not knowing that. Fantastic. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. Thank you. Um, another one come in here. Is there much of a step up from A level to university study? Oh, it's a re another really good question. And I'll, I'll let you have a have a go on this as well, James, in a second um, from your experience. For me, I found weirdly the jump between GCSE and A level more difficult than I did between A level and first year of university. But that I then found that the jump between first year at university and second year at university the biggest jump that I've ever experienced. So the first year at university is really there essentially to settle you in and essentially get everyone to the same level, thinking at the same level and, and, and producing work at the same level essentially. And um, so that's kind of its purpose, effectively, is to get you kind of everyone up to that same standard. Um, so the difference between A level and that first year university might not be so so large. But again, it's a personal thing. It happens, you know, on an individual basis. I've spoken to people before in the past that said they saw no jump at all between GCC and A level, but then there was a huge jump between A level and their first year university. I've spoken to people that, that don't think there was ever a jump from GCC all the way to finishing their university degree. So it is very personal. Um, but again, it, it is it, the, the purpose of that first year university is to really, you know, put you on an even level, an even level with everyone. James, did you have any kind of any uh, insight from your own experience on that? Yeah, I mean, fantastic. Um, that sort of really covers the academic side of things really well. I mean, personally, from my perspective, I also used to be a student at Royal Holloway as well. Um, I personally found it more of a sort of personal and social step up um, from maybe what you'd experience. Of course, it might be the first time in your life that you're going to be moving away from home. Um, you're going to be cooking for yourself, cleaning for yourself. Uh, essentially, you're going to be looking after yourself totally on your own for the first time in your life. Um, and I think that first year is really, really designed uh, to sort of get you up to speed personally on how to sort of look after yourself. It's a nice adjustment to, uh, as I said, potentially moving away from home for the first time. The academic side of things is then slightly different. Um, obviously, there may be certain things that you might cover. You might have already covered at A-level before, but hopefully there's lots of that sort of everyone coming from different academic backgrounds and getting up to that same level uh, for, you to, for you to then take off into your own research and exploration um, in second and third year. Um, so yeah, really good question that one. Thank you for submitting. Um, another one here, um, we've sort of got probably two more come in here. Um, do you do more exams if you do a joint honours course? So I think you did cover that in um, your talk but do you want to expand on that at all yeah of course um i think it really it, it does really depend on the courses it really depends on the modules as well when you get to university it becomes far more granular so it becomes far more rather than a course so in maths we do more exams than we do in uh business it becomes in x module you do this number of exams but in y module you do no exams so at university, you may have when you you know when you study at university, you may have a choice over what you study specifically for what your modules are, um, so your optional modules. And really, you can decide perhaps, for example, not to do any exams in that module so if that module doesn't ask for exams. Equally, you could do all exams if the module and pick modules that offer all exams essentially. So there are different options, and I don't think it's based on a course by course basis. And same with joint honours programs, I don't think it's really dependent on whether or not you do a joint honours or a single or a single honours. 
um, it really is just dependent on those specific modules that you're studying. So I said it's a real granular level. Again, when you're doing that research, you're looking in depth at those universities, that's kind of the level in some respects that you need to go into. Um, when you know when you kind of get down to that maybe final seven or eight universities and you're kind of whittling them down kind of under really are fine margins, but looking into detail actually what the modules are and how they're taught, how they're assessed. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a cover of the question a little bit, but uh, or a bit of a politician's answer, I should say. Um, but it but it does kind of it is really dependent on those specific modules rather than a course versus another course. Fantastic. No, that was really really good. Thank you. Um, now we've had one more sort of slightly more specific question, but I can see that law is potentially quite a, a popular course for people joining us this evening. Um, how does the law and criminology degree work and what sort of areas of work can you enter uh, into after this degree? I guess if I talk firstly on this, the big thing about law, um, you do get the LLB accreditation with our Royal Holloway degrees. Uh, that is obviously the first level of qualification you need within law to continue training in the future. So I believe off the top of my head, we are third uh, in the UK for graduate prospects within law specifically. Uh, so that really does mean, hopefully, when you come out the other side of your degree, partially because of that LLB accreditation, uh, but also past, partially maybe you may, might be able to get some work experience, you might want to do a year in industry, all things like that. Hopefully that could set you up for that future career of a barrister, solicitor, whatever it may be. Um, but as I said, you do get those really good starting points uh, with a law degree at Royal Holloway specifically. Um, fantastic. Hopefully that answers your question there. Um, if there is any other questions, we'll just give it another 20 seconds or so in, in case someone wants to submit any. Um, but yeah, just quickly, a, a thank you from me to you, Jim. Um, it's been really great, fantastic having you this evening and some of the information that you've shared has been really really useful uh, and i'm sure people at home will, will have found it really insightful as well and um, so thank you for your time my pleasure thank you very much james and thank you everyone that attended as i said hope it's been useful for you and um, best of luck with your with your search fantastic thank you jim um, i can see we've got no more questions come in so i think we will call that an evening for, uh, for tonight then um, as i said thank you again for joining us uh, hopefully it's been useful and of course if you do want to catch up uh, you want to go back over anything in tonight's session, it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, in the next few days. So, yes, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, best of luck with your search uh, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you.